things to say. My mind went blank for a second. Don't you hate that? If you're just coming in, where have you been? You missed some great Sunday school classes. Think about giving it a try. We have two adult classes. We have one over in the pastor study and one over here in the music room where we play a music video and we talk about it. And there's teen classes and little kids classes all around. There's something for every age. We invite you to come and try it out. You know, your, your bed will take you back tomorrow, next week if you didn't like it. So come and give it a shot. I have some announcements. Uh, February 12th, wear something bright. I'm talking those Hawaiian flowery shirts, whatever you got that's the brightest colors. We're going to bright this place up because it's been cold, it's been dreary, cloudy, gray. We don't like winter. We want something just to bring us back. We can have fun in church. So super bright Sunday. We know next week is super for something, but that's what it's going to be, super bright. The next Saturday, February 18th, we have a movie night, Life Mark. We just watched this the other night. We had not seen it before, and so we just kind of was curious, so we found it, watched it. It's amazing. I would just leave it at that. It's a really good movie. You will be blessed if you come watch it. It's about adoption, you know, redemption, the family love. It's, it's really good. Something really good to invite people. And you get some free popcorn and bottled water. And it's just a lot of fun. Time to get together and all that. I have a picture that needs to be put up real quick. My wife's birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> her a card and made her cry, so now I have to embarrass her and make her blush. <laughs> now comes the time when they tell me I can say anything I want, which probably should scare them a little, but all right, see that truck? This is what we're going to talk about real quick. If you have a friend standing in the middle of the road and you see that truck coming at him, what are you going to do? You're going to yell, you're going to scream, you're going to do everything you can to get him out from in front of that truck. Even if they tell you they don't believe a truck is dangerous or that a big in the middle of the road is dangerous, you're still going to do everything you can to get them away from that truck, right? We have friends and family who are on a way more dangerous path because they don't believe. You can't make them believe, but we can tell them. Share your story with them. Even if you think they don't believe, what if they don't listen? At least you tried. You know, I don't know what the end is going to be like, but they say there's that great judgment seat. Well, you don't want to walk away from that line and see your friend being dragged the wrong way and say, I wish I would have said something. You would much rather say, I wish they would have listened. Be bold. That's all I can. I mean, I honestly do believe we're getting closer and closer to the end. So just be bold and tell them. Have a Bible with you. You know, show them five verses if you think. Just something that will. But never, never think you shouldn't say something just because they might not listen or they might be offended or they, they don't believe, so it doesn't matter. Be bold and tell them. Lord, we just thank you for being with us. We pray for boldness to speak whenever we are led to speak. But we just pray that you will watch over and guide us, Lord. We thank you for the service. We pray for the pastor who has given the message. And we just, again, we thank you for everything. Amen. Thank you, Tim. As we enter into offering time, I want to read Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering 
and sacrifice to God. You really focus on that verse. It talks about how much sacrifice Jesus gave as an offering for you and for me. We have many ways of giving back to God and giving back to the Lord. You know, a lot of times it's easier to just to reach into our wallet and throw a few dollars in. We have time, talent, and money. And I think the Lord expects us to give appropriately as we can for each one of those. I'm going to take a few moments to talk about offering announcements because I got a couple slides and it's about the work and witness camp coming up May 7th through 12th which is an opportunity to give your time, your talent, and your energy back to the Lord. Um, there should be some um, slides. This is the flooded area of Sandy Valley that uh, the first work camp is going to. Um, I don't know what order these slides are in, but you can see that uh, I, hopefully by now all that's cleaned up and there's just repair work to be done. But I... I was down to Katrina in New Orleans and um, the aftermath, and that looks pretty much the same. Um, this is a ramp that they built for this man who was handicapped in a wheelchair um, to help that family go on. There's a couple more slides. Um, they're, they're building an, a porch there for another family and working. I thought there was one more slide. I guess not. But um, the... Um, Work camp is scheduled for um, May 7th through 12th, and um, the cost is $325. The church will underwrite part of that. I know several have given me some interest. There's online registration in a, in a couple weeks. If you need help getting that online in registration, I will sit down with you on Bertie's computer, and we'll do it. And hopefully I don't crash it. I could have Bertie sit down and do it with you, but no, I won't ask her to do that. Since she did an awesome job of doing that last flyer, who I found out actually pastor did. So Bertie, no raise for you, but I guess there's one for the pastor. But Bertie does an awesome job anyways. So, but I also want to announce that um, the district had such an interest in this work camp going to Sandy Valley. He is organized another one for August 13th through the 18th going to Cumberland Valley. Um, I think it will be some similar type of work. I'm not sure. He did not have a lot of information other than a date, and he did say there was enough interest in the district to do two work camps. So, um, so keep that in mind, and if you need further information, do see me. Um, if you see Bertie, she'll tell you to see me. Just cut out the middle lady and just come right to me. One other thing about offering announcements. End of the month, Alabaster's coming up. February 26th. So I'm going to ask that you keep saving your nickels, dimes, and quarters. And any loose $100 bills you have floating in your billfold you don't know what to do with. And put them in Alabaster offerings. That offering goes to build buildings and do works on the mission field 100%. There's no overhead cost whatsoever. Um, the ch church in general underwrites that. So um, keep on your calendar, Alabaster offering, February 26th. So that's enough of the announcements for offering and offering possibilities. We have some local requests. Um, the focus this month is, um, I got it wrote down here, if I can find it. Pray for Hand Up Village. Um, did you know that one of the local churches is helping the homeless of Mercer County? Now I want to see a show of hands. How many of you know there was homeless people in Mercer County? Just a few. I don't know the extent of it, but uh, when I was interim pastor at Snyder Road in Piqua, I came across a homeless lady in her 40s. I would not have known she was homeless. Um, 
early one morning, we drove into the church parking lot, and there was a car there. And I go, man, they beat the preacher. But she had her car. I invited her to church, but um, um, she was uncomfortable. But she did come, and she attended for a period of time. And a lady in the church offered up an apartment that she had for this lady. But I found out that she was in the military and she had postpartum depression or whatever that term is that the, when they come out of the military. Um, and she could not function in society. She was very paranoid. Um, she was able to hold down, but she wasn't able to stay in any one place. So those people are out there. But um, Bounding Grace Ministries are helping that, and that's, it's called Hand Up Village. And they have a place that the homeless can go and get some help. But we're going to lift them up in, in prayer this morning. Um, also, the persecuted church is Benin, and it's the birthplace of voodoo. And that's a place I don't think I'd want to go. But we need people to go there and leave them know the love of Jesus Christ. Local request. Remember, continue to remember Jim and Sherry. Um, Sherry's recovering from covid Kate Ballinger is recovering from a UTI. Um, Carmen Ayers is recovering also. And Dottie Baker is recovering from her knee replacement. And, and um, so is Mike, I think. <laughs> you know, when you're married, when your spouse hurts, you hurt. In more ways than one sometimes. Um, and there's others recovering. Let's continue to lift. You do, Mark. Whoa. Hello. Okay, it's back. Good to see you, Gretchen. You bless every heart that's here this morning, knowing that God answers prayer. Can I get an amen? amen. A little louder. We serve a loving God that answers prayer. So, um, Ron is going to give an offertory. And you'll be blessed. So. Thank you. 
beautiful song this morning. Thank you for leading us to the throne with that beautiful song. Do you feel like a praise of celebration this morning? Yeah. Celebrate a praise for what Jesus has done in your life. Let's stand together. You'll recognize this song, this medley. I love the orchestration of this, and I hope you do too. It's not how we used to sing the songs, but I think it's a time of celebration for us. Put a smile on your face. It's good. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power.
Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for servers such as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. What was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Well, might the, the sun, sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died, for man the creature's sin. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. But drops of grief can never repay. The debt of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight, and now I am happy all the way. Not only are you happy, but Christ gives us the joy, the joy in our lives, and we thank him for the mighty things he's done for us. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood, for giving your life and sacrifice for us. Let's thank him this morning as we sing. Save my life, brought me 
from the darkness into glorious light. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the As we enter into prayer time, Lori gave her request. But maybe you have a request by the upraised hand of a special need in your heart or your life or your family. The Lord knows those needs and all the others at the church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, just your name can calm soul-sick heart, a troubled life, a wayward soldier. Just your name can bring peace and strength to a person going through a struggle. Jesus, as we come to you this morning, we come with the audacity to believe that you're a God that hears and answers prayer, that you care about us, mere humans, weak and frail at times. Sometimes we slip and fall, but we have the audacity that there's a God that loves us so much that he sent a Savior named Jesus to die for us. Father, as we come to you in the name of Jesus this morning, we come because you say, come boldly before the throne. And even though every instinct in our lives said we ought to come meekly and unworthy, we are taught in Scripture 
that in Jesus Christ we are worthy. We come under his shield, under his banner, as soldiers of the faith. Father, this day we ask that you would meet the needs of your people. We think of Jim and Sherry and ask that you would be both with both of them, and especially Sherry as she's recovering from COVID. Lord, we pray for Kate Ballinger and ask that you would meet her needs and touch her and leave her know that she's loved by you in this congregation. We pray the same prayer for Carmen Ayers and ask that you would touch her. And as Dottie Baker is recovering from surgery, we know that this is sometimes very painful to go through, especially the therapy afterwards, and ask that you would just bless her this morning and meet her needs. Father, there are others in the congregation that are battling a sickness, an illness, mental or physical, sometimes emotional. We pray that you would just touch their lives, meet their needs, encourage them, and bless them. Father, we pray for the Hand Up Ministry, helping the homeless of our county. Lord, I doubt if more than one or two, if any, in the sound of my voice this morning would know what it would be like to be homeless. We can't imagine to walk in those shoes because you blessed us abundantly in so much, in so many ways. But we do know that in Jesus we can reach out and help. So we pray for our fellow church that's doing a ministry that we cannot do or are not called to do. We pray that you'll meet their needs. Father, we pray that you would be in the furtherance of this service. We pray for anointing on pastor as he brings the message. Allow him to flow in the spirit with your words of encouragement, strength, and power. We ask all these things in the mighty and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys thought you'd get two weeks without me, didn't you? No, you're not that lucky. <laughs> it is good to be with you, and uh, uh, just want to, once again, on Gretchen's behalf, in my behalf, thank you for all your support and love and prayers during these last few difficult months. She is on the road to recovery, and we're believing for complete healing in the name of Jesus. And so thank the Lord for what he's doing there. And uh, it is good to be able to share God's word with you. I did want to just very quickly uh, add a little bit to what Phil was saying about the Hands Up or Hand Up Village. Um, they do minister to people who are find themselves in a transient part of their life where they're homeless, either through coming out of jail and they don't have anywhere to go, or perhaps they've just hit on hard times. And the neat thing about it is they don't just give them say, well, you can stay here for free for so many. No, there's a whole program involved in it that helps them get back up on their feet. To stay there, they have to find a, and, and they'll help them with it, uh, find a job. They help them find transportation. Um, and then they can stay there for up to six months. And while they're there, half of their paycheck goes into an account so that they can have a down payment for an apartment and buy some basic things to get started again. And, uh, and there is a neat little story done by Channel 7, WHIO. If you just Google uh, Hands Up or Hand Up Village WHIO or something like that, it should pop up. And they did a really neat uh, news uh, uh, article on it, and, uh, and it'll teach, teach you about it. And it's just a great, great ministry that's happening right here in Salina. 
and uh, they're getting to the point where they will be, um, they haven't sent information out yet, but they will be seeking help with cleaning of cabins and general maintenance and landscaping, things like that, because it's just getting too much for uh, Rick, uh, who heads it up, uh, Pastor Rick Brocher, to do all himself. And so if you would like to get involved at some point, they will be sending information out about that. So anyway, I just wanted to let you know, I, I just think it's a, neatest, a neat ministry that most people don't even know is back there. Uh, so uh, that's just great. But uh, we're looking at God's Word this morning, and I invite you to turn with me, if you haven't already done so, by looking at the slide there, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, the great love chapter, <coughs> excuse me, of the Bible. And uh, it's, a, uh, it's a chapter in which the Holy Spirit just inspires the Apostle Paul to describe love, because, you know, love is it's kind of hard to describe sometimes. And there's a lot of different definitions, a lot of different ideas about what love is. And so God just inspires the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 to perfectly describe what love actually really is. Its characteristics, what it does, what it does not do. And uh, we're looking at this in a three-part message I've entitled, The Greatest is Love, because we are in the month of February. In February, on the secular calendar, is a month in which love is emphasized because Valentine's Day is right smack dab in the middle of February, just to give you a heads up there. It's coming up here soon. And so we're going to look at this idea of love, and in honor of February being Love Month, I have, as I tend to do from time to time, scoured the internet for minutes, if even that long, to find the corniest, awfulest love jokes you will ever hear. And I'll limit it to five, because there's a lot of them out there. And uh, these are ones even your three-year-old would probably groan at. So here we go. How did the telephone propose to its girlfriend? Well, he Gave her a ring, of course. How else would they do it? I know, you can feel free to, free to groan here. <laughs> what did one boat say to the other? Are you up for a little romance? My new girlfriend works at the zoo. I think she's a keeper. I told you these were bad. What do you call two birds in love? Tweet hearts, of course. And then the last one, a husband and wife had been married for 60 years. And during that whole time, they, they kept no secrets from e each other except for one. The wife had a little box she kept locked in their closet, and she absolutely forbade her husband to ever look into that box. Well, after 60 years of marriage, she finally says, okay, you can look in the box. And so he opens it up, and he finds a crocheted doll in about $75,000 worth of cash. So he's, of course, a little curious. And he asks about the doll. What, what's this doll about? And she said, well, when we first got married, my mother gave me advice on how to have a great marriage. Whenever you get mad at your husband, don't argue with him, crochet a doll. Well, he was really touched by that. Wow, only one doll after 60 years of marriage. How great is that? Well, what about the money? Where did that come from? She said, oh, that's what I raised selling all the other dolls I crocheted. <laughs> <laughs> so, bad jokes about love, but it is getting you thinking about love. In spite of these terrible jokes about love, we understand really the absolute importance of love. Even the world does. They, they understand we were created or we're made to love and be loved. That's just how we are. Our mental health, our spiritual health, of course, even the wholeness of society depends on how well we love one another. We give and receive love. That's why you'll find in secular society countless songs and poems and movies and stories and on and on we go are all centered on love. We were created to love and be loved. And of course, it's no surprise that love is absolutely central to living out a biblical faith. 
It is absolutely essential. It's not a side issue. It's not, well, that would be nice if we did that. It is central to what it means to live out a biblical faith. First of all, God is love. We understand that. Uh, 1 John 4, 8 declares God is love. He doesn't just love. He actually is love. He's the very personification of love. And then, of course, Jesus reminds us that the greatest commandment is to love God with everything we have. And the second is like it, meaning you can't do one without doing the other. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And wrapped up in that is everything else you could think of. You get that right, you get everything else right. And so love is central to what it means to be a Christian. And so in light of this, we're going to begin a short three-part series. I've simply entitled, The Greatest is Love, based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here's the thing. We're not doing this just so we can learn a little bit more about what the Bible says about love. And what well, not that interesting? And a little other nugget that you can put in your brain along with everything else you've ever heard that's not the idea i want to look at this so that we can live it out better that's really what the word of god's about isn't it living it out if we don't apply it if we're not living out the truth and allowing through the grace of god for him to transform us to live out this life of love we can study love till jesus comes back it won't do a bit of good for us or anyone else and so I trust that as we look at this, we don't just look at it academically, but we look at it personally. Lord, what's this saying to me? How can I better live this out through your grace? That's what I hope comes from this. And today we're going to look at the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13 about how love is absolutely essential to everything else we do as a Christian. As I said, it's not an add-on. It's not a nice little thing if we get to it. It is absolutely essential to everything that we do. And so we'll look at verses 1 through 3, but let's begin by reading the entire chapter. It's not that long of a chapter, and it just speaks beautifully about love. So let's go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease, and where there's tongues, they will be stilled, and where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Isn't that a great description of what love is? What it really is? You want to know what love is? If your thinking gets a little clouded because of the culture we're in, well, what exactly is loving? What, what does love look like? Revisit this chapter. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, just three things here to bring out from it. And the first thing is found in verse number 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Love must control 
our words. Now, I know in the specifics here, the Apostle Paul, of course, is addressing a situation in the Corinthian church where their worship services were just absolutely a chaotic mess because people were going there and exercising their spiritual gifts just willy-nilly. Well, you got a word from God? Well, I got a better word. You got a word of prophecy? Well, listen to me. And everyone's talking at the same time and involved in all that was the use of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And so Paul's laying the framework that Everything we do has to be controlled by love or it's of no use. As a matter of fact, it becomes destructive. And so stepping back from the specifics of that, what we can say is that love must control all our words. Even if we speak with the tongues of men and angels, if we're not doing it in love, it doesn't do any good and it's destructive. And so let's expand that principle just to include all our words. That love needs to control what comes out of our mouth. Love needs to control the words that we use, whether they be verbal, whether they be written, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you're on, something we repost. Love has to control our communication. It needs to control our words. Think about it this way. Even if you have a message that you know came directly from God himself. He gave you a vision. Say this. Post this. Even if what you are saying is absolutely 100% truth and biblical, even if the position you're taking on a particular issue is absolutely 100% right, even if the truth is spoken needs to be something that needs to be heard, and will bring life and light and, and hope and healing. If it is not spoken, controlled by love, then what Paul says here is it becomes just noise, a clanging cymbal, a, a, just the banging of, of, of the cymbal and the clanging of the cymbal and of the gong. It, it's just noise. It doesn't do any good. It's at best a distraction to the cause of Christ and at worst destructive. And uh, so think about an orchestra. How many here have ever played in a band or orchestra? Okay, some of you. Not me. I've heard a lot of them especially as a grandparent, and uh, our kids were in a band as well, or our kids, Matt was, and we've been to a lot of our grandkids' stuff, and I've learned that they got to play together. That if you're in an orchestra, and you, especially if you got a per percussion instrument, like drums or cymbals, we'll go with what the Bible says, and you're sitting there, and you're like, I don't care what they're playing, I'm just going to bang on these things so everyone notices me. And you just start banging, 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 banging. You're going to ruin the whole thing, right? And that's what he's saying when, when we're communicating. But love is not controlling what we're saying or what we're communicating. We become just like a, a gong or a, a clanging cymbals. It doesn't mesh. It distracts or destroys what God's trying to do. And I'm sure we can all think of examples of this where Christians, and God knows their hearts, but they claim to be Christian, maybe they truly are, and maybe what they're saying in a sermon or teaching or posting or whatever communication means they're using is even absolutely right, but they're saying it and without love. They're just harsh and bitter about it. And love is not controlling what they're, what they're communicating. How much good does that really do? But it's easy to point fingers at other people. Have you ever spoken or said or communicated something without love controlling it? <laughs> you don't have to answer that out loud. I think we all have done that, been there and done that, and got the T-shirt, as they say. What we need to do is, through the grace of God, just ask God, Lord, everything that comes out of my mouth, everything that, that I communicate may be done through the motivation of love. Love not as the world describes, but love as described here in 1 Corinthians 13. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 tells us to speak the truth in love. That's the template for us. And in all of this, truth is absolutely important. You cannot deny truth and be speaking lovingly. You know, what Tim, the illustration Tim used about the truck. You know, to just say, well, we're going to say there's no hell because people don't like the concept of hell or eternal damnation or judgment, so we'll just say it doesn't exist. So that's not love. Not according to the Word of God. The Word of God says love rejoices in the truth. But love also speaks that word of warning out of care and concern for the lost with tears, with a burden. And of course, Jesus perfectly <coughs> illustrates how to live out this kind of love, this perfect balance of, of truth and love. Truth and grace, the Word of God says he's full of. And we need to be as well through the grace of God. And so we need to just watch our words, whether they be spoken, verbal, nonverbal, posting something, reposting something. Is it done in love? Is it truth? Is it done in love? And we need to judge what we do by that. Love must control our words. Let's go ahead and move on here. Love must also control our abilities. Look at verse 2. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And here, of course, the Apostle Paul's addressing certain spiritual gifts that they were elevating. Even he himself says were of vital importance. The word of uh, uh, prophecy, or the, uh, thus saith the Lord. And, uh, and so he's not saying these aren't important, but they have to be controlled by love. They have to be controlled by love. And once again, we can expand this to include any and all our abilities, all the things we do that God gives us the ability to do. The natural talents we have need to be controlled by love. The spiritual gifts we have, whether they be the ones he specifically mentions here or other spiritual gifts, the areas of ministries and calling that God has for us has to be controlled by love. See, what we tend to do is we tend to look at these types of things as a job, if you will, to do, a task to do. Um, for instance, you're teaching a Sunday school class, just as an example. Okay, well, I got to get a lesson together. That's a task. Okay, I got to be there at this time. That's a task. Well, I taught the class. I got that over and done with. And it's a box we tend to check mark. Singing on the praise team, working in the nursery, uh, doing whatever God's calling you to do, even in your own personal life. We can look at it as tasks to do. But that's really the wrong way to look at it. No, what we need to do is have love controlling it. And when love is controlling what we're doing, what we see is that ministry is not about the task we're doing. It involves that, obviously, but it's about the people we're ministering to. So all of a sudden, breakfast isn't just, well, I got breakfast this week, and I got to get it over with and check that box off so Bertie won't bug me for another month. <laughs> By the way, I really do appreciate those of you who provide breakfast. Uh, it is such a great thing. But keep in mind, it's about the people, not the breakfast. The people that come, that come and are encouraged to come to fellowship, to draw closer to one another during the time of breakfast, and then be here to be discipled in, in the Sunday school classes. That's what it's about. Same, and we can go on with the praise team and so on and so forth. But when people focus on just the task itself, they, they get the idea, well, I can do this and not put love in it. And so you have situations where singers, uh, you know, Christian singers don't want to mess with the people. Well, I'm here to give the concert and I don't want to talk to anyone. Pastors that are too busy doing tasks to really care about the flock. Lay people doing tasks but not really loving the people they're ministering to. And so we got to be careful about that. What we do, our abilities, our callings, our giftedness, must be controlled by love. You know, there's an old saying, if it were not for people, 
or if it weren't for people, ministry would be easy. And of course, that's a tongue-in-cheek comment because ministry is about the people. You can't do ministry without being involved with people. And therefore, since people are involved, love must control our abilities. And so, once again, gifts, talents, abilities, the things you do for the Lord, the thing God is using you, they're vital. Not saying they're not needed. Obviously, they are. But what we do for God, the gifts and graces we're operating in, has to be controlled by love or they amount to nothing. And so heart check is what I'm doing for the Lord. Am I focusing on the people or the task? Am I being controlled by love or by something else? Love must control our abilities. And then lastly, love must control our giving. Look at verse 3. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, as this version puts it, or as uh, the one up there says, I, um, I give my body to hardship that I may boast. If I give in these spectacular ways, but I, have lo but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love has to control our giving. And financial giving, obviously, but giving in every other way as well. Why do people give to the cause of Christ? Why do people sacrifice? Is it always out of love? You'd like to think so, but not always. A lot of people are even taught to give to get. I mean, just turn on a lot of television preachers, you'll hear that. You know, God told me that the first thousand people to give a thousand dollars, he's going to give it back to you a hundredfold. They'll even call your gifts to God an investment because you're going to get a return bigger than what you gave. Well, that's giving to get. And, then, and of course, that's easy to fruit to knock off. But sometimes it can get a little less new or a little more nuanced than that. Has someone ever manipulated you? Pretended to be your friend or pretended to do something nice for you and you thought, boy, that's really neat of them to do that. And then you find out they did it simply because they wanted something from you? That's giving to get. Have we ever done that? Have we ever extended friendship or done something nice or, or given in some way simply because we wanted to get back for it? People can give to get. You can give to feed your ego. Well, I'll give this so everyone will see. That's what the Pharisees did. Remember, Jesus talked about how they would give these gifts and announce it with trumpets and get all this praise of men. What did he think about that? We can give to feed our ego. We can give to feel good. Nothing wrong with feeling good about giving, but that can't be the primary motivation. And we can just give because, well, I, I feel good when I do it. But you see, if that's the only motivation, then what are you going to do when you don't feel good and God's telling you to give? You can give out of peer pressure. Well, everyone else is doing it. I guess I better do something. You can give because of guilt. I mean, all these are different motivations that people can give, but what we're reminded of here in 1 Corinthians 13, 3 is that love has to be driving the bus in our giving. You can have these secondary motivations, and probably we do. It does feel good to give, and sometimes we do give out of obligation, but that can't be the primary motivation. The primary motivation has to be that of love. Love for God and love for others. Why do I give to support the church? Well, you're a pastor. They'd fire you if you didn't give. Well, probably wouldn't set a good example if I didn't give. But that can't be my main motivation. Because what's going to happen when I quit pastoring at some point? No, I give because I love God and I'm thankful for what he's done in my life. I'm thankful for his blessings in my life. And I give so that other people can know him and grow in him. And so I support the work of the church. That's the primary reason. Love of God, love of others. That needs to be the motivation. That of love. Love has to drive this bus or it just doesn't work out. 
So here we're reminded that love is absolutely essential to what we do. It's essential to our words. It's essential to our abilities. It's essential to our giving. If we're to get anywhere, it, all of that must be controlled by love for God and love for others. So the uh, application is simple. And uh, Dad, you can go ahead and uh, come to the piano. Is love driving this bus? Are you doing things out of love for God and love for others as the primary motivation? And really, only you can answer that. We can't answer it for you. And I believe what God's calling us to do this morning with this is just say, Lord, search my heart. If my first love has cooled, and I remember when I first rededicated my life to the Lord. There was a, not just an emotional thing, you know, emotion comes and goes, but there was and is a passion for God that I cannot allow to wane. The very first thing I was asked to do in ministry after I rededicated my life to the Lord, I was the advertising director for our monthly missionary meetings. I'm going back a ways here. Wednesday night, once a month, we had a missionary meeting where the whole service was about missions. And uh, I was to advertise it and encourage people to come. And so I remember, I, I'm sure if I had a picture of it, it'd look pretty hokey, you know, with all our computer technology now. But I hand drew a poster, and I remember my first poster, I had this road with people in cars driving to missionary meeting. I even tried to make the people in the cars look like some of the people in our church. I don't know how good a job I did with that. But my point is, I did it out of love for God, love for others. I can't lose that. I can't lose that kind of passion. I cannot allow myself to let other motivations drive these types of things. So Lord, search my heart. What about your heart? If in that searching, you find that you've lost your first love, it's cooled, you've drifted from it, the good news is this isn't to beat us over the head and make us leave here feeling terrible about ourselves. Jesus gives us the answer to that in the book of Revelations, Church of Ephesus, where to repent and return repent humbly and contritely admit I'm not where I need to be with this and God I want, it, I want it turned around you can't turn it around yourself you can't work this love up God has to put it in your heart God's got to do the work in you but you supply the willingness and to repent is simply to recognize this has cooled I'm not where I once was in all this and God, I need you to do a new work in me. And I want you to do it. And then return. Return back to simple faith in the cross. Return back to simple trust in the blood of Jesus to make it happen. Return back to simple, simple walking with Jesus. Man, we do that. God will reignite the fire of your love for him. So I'm going to ask that we stand as we close, and I'm just going to say a prayer that will cover all of us. And obviously, the altars are always open. If you feel a need to come and pray specifically, the altar is always open. But this is something I think all of us can draw from and go deeper in. So as I pray, don't just listen to me. You talk to God about where you're at in this. And let's let, let God do a new work in us. Father, we thank you for your grace in our life. Without your grace, we wouldn't even care about any of this. Who cares if what we're doing is out of love? But the very fact, Lord, that you put it in our heart to want to go deeper in all of this, that's your grace. That shows you're doing a work in us even now. So I pray, Father, for each one of us, myself at the head of the line, that, Lord, where our love has cooled, 
where we have, we have begun to do things and serve you just out of obligation or guilt or other, other motivations except that of love. That, Father, you would speak to our heart. We repent of that. We ask, Father, you would turn us around by your grace. And this morning, at this moment, as we surrender to you again, Lord, do a new work in our heart. Ignite a new fire in your people. So that when we leave here today, Lord, love will be driving the bus in all we do for you. Love will be controlling our words. Love will be controlling our abilities. Love will be controlling our sacrificing and giving to you. And as we do that, Father, and continue in that, we know you're going to help us to grow deeper in the knowledge of the love you have for us. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us this morning through your word. Thank you for your continued grace in our life. We receive what you have for us right now by faith in Jesus. We receive it and we thank you for it as we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you for being here. Have a great rest of the day. Tell someone what they miss not being here and uh, have a wonderful week in the Lord. We'll see you here Wednesday.